We want to start our museum midday by recognizing that the Tongass Historical Museum and Totem Heritage Center are located on the traditional lands of the Tontiquan and Sanyaquan people of the Clinkett First Nations. We're grateful for the opportunity to live and learn here in mutual respect and appreciation. Hello, welcome to this Museum Midday. Uh, my name is Erica Jane Christian. I'm the Program Coordinator here with Ketchikan Museums, and uh, we are glad to have you be part of this first uh, Museum Midday of our season. Um, our season of programs and presenters runs from September all the way through May. Uh, each month, the first Thursday of the month, we would invite you to join us uh, during the noon hour uh, to plug into these really great lineup, uh, to this really great lineup of presenters and programs. Um, our first presenter of the season, uh, and why you've joined us today, Megan Spencer will be sharing a little bit about the book, Painful Beauty, Clinton Women, Bead Work, and the Art of Resilience. If you have questions throughout this museum midday presentation, please feel free to add them down below in the chat. Um, and we want to thank you again for uh, spending a little bit of your noontime hour with us here. I want to thank and introduce our speaker today. Um, Megan, can you please tell us uh, a little bit about yourself and where you're joining us from today? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Megan Smetzer. Uh, I was born and raised in Fairbanks, Alaska, but I currently uh, live and work in the unceded and traditional territories of the Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam people, uh, who are the caretakers of this beautiful place we call Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, I have also uh, had the great privilege to spend a lot of time in Clinkett Ani, uh, talking to elders and artists and scholars uh, whose work really has uh, contributed and shaped uh, my thinking on, on the history of, of beading. Uh, so I, you know, with great pleasure, am, I'm here today to share some of that, that knowledge um, and you know, answer questions uh, once we've gone through the, the presentation. So full disclosure, um... All of us here in the office at the Totem Heritage Center have been geeking out over your dissertation. Um, so we're really curious to see uh, how your research and, and how your book has developed uh, and changed from that initial research and that initial um, dissertation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, it's uh, it definitely, there's some connection between the dissertation and the book, but I actually am really pleased with kind of how my thinking has changed over the past you know, couple of decades. And uh, I'm really uh, happy with how this book turned out because it focuses much more on, uh, less on the context of um, museums and that, and much more on the women who are creating this work. And so uh, for me, that's really an important change in, in, from the dissertation to, to the book. Fantastic. Uh, well, as we mentioned earlier, uh, as you go through and kind of introduce us to uh, your book, Painful Beauty, and, and the different topics that are covered there, um, if anyone comes up with questions or things they're curious about, uh, you know, things resonate or they just want to uh, comment or engage, uh, feel free to do so in the comments below and we'll see that those questions get answered. Um, but Megan, I'll go ahead and hand things off to you. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, in my talk today, I want to kind of go over uh, some of the themes that emerge uh, in my exploration of, of beading in Southeast Alaska over the past 150 years or so. Um, as I do that, I'm going to start first with the title because it is a bit of an unusual title, I think. Um, the press wasn't 100% sure they were gonna let me use it until I explained what it meant. Uh, so this, this title really came out of an experience, um, a couple of experiences I had uh, way back in 2009. I came up for, to Juno for the Klan Conference and had a, a great conversation with Della Cheney, who some of you may know, um, who explained to me how important beading was and how beautiful beading was and why it was so quickly incorporated into Klinkit cultural practices, the color, the creativity, all of those things were, were why um, women started using these, these seed beads, which were introduced in the 19th century. But she also reminded me that along with that beauty came the pain of settler colonialism. Uh, so the missionization, residential schools, uh, diseases, uh, and so forth. And so, you know, beading has always been connected to, to that, that pain of, of colonialism as well. So this concept was really reinforced for me. A couple months later, I was on a train 
on my way to Montreal, Quebec, and I saw this huge billboard in the sky uh, as I was traveling into the city. And I, I watched this billboard uh, for you know, 10, 15 minutes as, I, as the train slowly moved into the train station. Uh, this is a work, and I'm showing you here a, a photograph of, of the billboard uh, by the Anishinaabe artist, Rebecca Belmore. It's a work titled Fringe, and it's a very powerful work. It shows a reclining uh, woman, uh, an indigenous woman, and across her back is a diagonal scar. Hanging from that scar are strings of sinew uh, with blood red beads on them. Uh, Rebecca Belmar's work is really about um, the kind of out, uh, the, the impact of settler colonialism has a, a huge effect on, on the bodies of indigenous women. And this is kind of the statement she is making with this work. Um, it's a, a wound, it's a near fatal wound, but as uh, Belmar herself says, it is a wound that can heal, that can be recovered from. So combining the words of Della Cheney and the image of Rebecca Belmore, uh, I really thought this was a powerful metaphor for the whole book that beating is something that was introduced um, and it has really beautiful positive uh, elements to it, but it also uh, absolutely represents that, that pain of settler colonialism uh, that indigenous people, uh, not only in Southeast Alaska, but across North America have been resisting um, and uh, have shown incredible resilience uh, too over these years. And you know, I really understood this, this idea intellectually until I had these conversations and, and it, it hit me viscerally and I really, I really got it for, for the first time. So the subtitle of the book, Plinket Women, Beadwork and the Art of Resilience, um, completely inspired by uh, the late great work of Clarissa Rizal, uh, Nahin Weaver. Uh, this work is her resilience robe. It is a brilliant work that uh, shows the impacts of settler colonialism, but highlights the ways in which Plinket people have, um, have resisted that history, have shown resilience through that history, through the development of organizations such as the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood. Um, and I, I think that what this robe also really does is asserts um, the power of women in a way that uh, is not seen in the scholarly literature because uh, if you go to museums, if you read the literature, the focus has primarily been on the cultural output of, of men carved and painted masks, totem poles, and so on. You know, some weaving, has, weaving has gotten some attention, but for the most part, women's work is um, very, very little work or research has been done on it. And so her robe, I think, is a, a way of acknowledging the fact that within customary practices, women and men had equal, maybe different roles, but they were, they were considered equal. And so trying to reassert that balance between men and women. Uh, and so for that, I, I think, Clarissa and her, her brilliant work for, for, for foregrounding that. Um, and also just as, uh, uh, you know, as, as I've you know, gone through the various chapters as we go through them, I'm trying to keep in mind some of the core cultural concepts um, uh, of, of, of Clinket ways of knowing, um, the concept of Ha'ani, the land, Halatzin, the body, mind, and spirit, which is kind of the warrior spirit, uh, Hashuka which is thinking about the ancestors as well as future generations and which got uh, balance and harmony, which I think are, are coming back into, it's coming back into balance with, with this focus on, uh, on a renewed focus and increased focus on the work of women. So uh, just briefly, the introduction uh, is where I set up all of my arguments. Um, I talk about the role of museums in kind of marginalizing the, the work of women. Um, and talk about you know, how, how do we shift that balance back. Um, and I think one of the ways of doing that is acknowledging the work that's coming out of communities themselves. This, this quote uh, written by Louis Shotridge in 1921, I think uh, is a great way to think about all of that knowledge um, that stays, has stayed in communities, um, uh, but needs to, to be brought out to balance the, the kind of scholarly histories that are out there. Uh, Shotridge writes, an invader might satisfy himself in saying that the native customs and habits have about disappeared, but could the lid of the true woman's mind be thrown open, there would be seen the mystic veneration of her art still alive and active. And I think this is just a powerful way of thinking through uh, this history, that knowledge that's been passed from mother to daughter, from grandmother uh, to, to granddaughter uh, throughout the past 150 years. 
Um, you know, beadwork has long been used within Clinton communities uh, as regalia, as gifts made for sale. Um, but again, beadwork, like the work created by Indigenous women, has, has long been overlooked. Uh, so again, the, the intention of my book was really to bring together a wide range of sources to shift this dialogue and to recognize the importance of these cultural belongings made by women. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm really grateful to all the artists and the elders and the scholars who shared their, their stories and memories of me, uh, memories of, of beading with me. Um, and I also have combined these, these uh, stories with uh, research in archives and museums across North America, um, and also historic photographs primarily because so little has been written on beading that I've used photographs as documents for, for information. Um, and so really great way to uh, get at some of the early, um, early beading that was being done. So each chapter in the book really builds from the analysis of a single work uh, that encompasses the social, economic, and cultural context of the era in which it was made. Uh, so two of the chapters are set in the late 19th, early 20th century. One is set in the mid 20th century, I have a contemporary chapter, and then finally an epilogue uh, that crosses that imposed border between uh, what we now call the United States and Canada. So we will uh, talk a little bit about that. So I'm gonna move to uh, the first kind of case study, if you will. Um, this is a chapter uh, on the souvenir trade in the 19th century uh, in Southeast Alaska. And I have to say, this is probably one of my favorite stories in the book. This pair of moccasins I came across when I was doing research at the University of Pennsylvania Museum. And it's you know, very similar to the thousands of moccasins that were made in the late 19th century into the early 20th century and you know, sold to tourists from all over the world. Many of them ended up in museums, but they really never have any information connected to them. This pair is an exception. This pair, we know who collected it. Her name was Mary Sharples Schaefer. We know when she collected it. She traveled to Alaska in 1888. And we know how she collected it, which is completely uh, uh, amazing. And this is because there's a couple of notes with the work uh, with these moccasins. One collected in Sitka from a, a, an Indian woman um, using the language of the time. Um, and then the second uh, note that was with it said, the sailing of the vessel prevented the maker and donor from completing the second S. So immediately you have this picture in your mind of you know, the, the, the steamer is about to leave, about to leave and yet the, the beater is trying to make these moccasins and hands them over. So these, these moccasins have always intrigued me and I've always been like, who is the woman who made these moccasins? Well, several years later, uh, I happened to do a Google search and I came across the fact that Mary Sharples Schaefer's papers were in archives in Banff, Alberta. And as it turns out, there is an unpublished manuscript that talks about her story or her journey to Alaska in 1888. It's very fictionalized, um, it's very romantic, but based on some of the information in that story, um, you could kind of reconstruct the moment that, that this happened. Uh, in the, the heroine of the story, Mary uh, meets this young uh, Clinkett woman uh, whose husband was, went uh, seal hunting two years earlier, but never came home. She was somewhat ill but they connected on this, this level, this kind of almost spiritual level. Um, and uh, you know, she talks about having to leave, her chaperone needed her to leave, um, but the woman, uh, the beater asked for her name to be written on a piece of paper. And the next morning, uh, just as the ship is about to pull away, the young woman comes running up to the boat with the, this pair of moccasins and says, you know, uh, you know I, I didn't have time to finish it, you know, one uh, has the S, which is her last name, the letter from her last name. The second has no letter, all love. And it's just this, you know, kind of brilliant moment. And in thinking of that, you know, this was a gift. Um, and that term all love really shows that she is uh, emphasizing reciprocity and love. She found the sympathetic woman, they had this conversation, this connection, and as a way of kind of balancing out that, that exchange, she's presented as a gift, um, this pair of moccasins to this, this woman. And so to be able to kind of find that, that other side of the story for me was just a, it's so exciting. And so I love, I love this particular story. Um, and again, you know, this is a, a chapter about the souvenir trade and this is not technically a souvenir, it's a gift, but it, there's no doubt that the young woman who made these moccasins also made moccasins for sale. Um, and just to show you the, the image from the cover, which is one of my favorite images in this book, this is more typical. This is uh, somebody 
looking uh, from the side of the steamship, looking down into uh, the boats that are pulled up beside the, the women in the boats have their wares arrayed um, and spread out so people can purchase. You can see uh, model poles, you can see baskets, you can see a whole bunch of different kinds of beaded work. And my favorite is the little baby in the bow uh, of this boat you can see here. It's just, you know, working mothers all the way through. I think it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, photograph. So moving on to the next chapter, which also takes place um, in the late 19th, early 20th century, you probably are familiar with this photograph. This is a photo by E.W. Merrill taken during the so-called last potlatch, uh, the week that took place in Sitka in 1904. Um, this is probably the most reproduced photograph uh, from that particular event, even though there were probably close to three dozen images uh, taken. Um, but what most people don't see in this photograph is the incredible array of beaded regalia. And this to me is, is really exciting because, you know, again, picture in your mind, uh, it's December 1904, uh, it's gray, the skies are gray, the ocean is gray blue, the, the mountains are dark green from the covered in the trees, maybe there is some snow on the, the tops of the, of the mountains, um, but, you know, here, uh, the thousand people who came to Sitka during this time period are wearing their finest regalia. And just to give you one little example, here is a, an octopus bag um, actually being worn um, by the man here on the, on the end of uh, the bench seated in the front. Um, this is a photograph of Sitka hosts and Yakutat guests. It's really embodying the kind of balance of reciprocity between clans that are being worked out in this, this supposed last potlatch. Um, but again, this, this rich history of beading as regalia, I argue that um, some of it is, you can consider it as resistance uh, because you know, the settlers who lived there didn't see this as authentic um, because these were materials that were purchased, that were introduced. Um, it was a way of asserting those clan identities um, in a way that was not necessarily taken as seriously by by the governor, by the military, and, and so on. And I just want to show one other image from, uh, from this potlatch. These are the Klukwan guests uh, from uh, uh, the Chilkat Valley. Um, and here, just to show you a couple of pieces of regalia, uh, you see this amazing collar showing a white raven. Uh, but what to me is really important, and this is worn here by this, this gentleman on the end. Uh, what to me is really uh, important about this piece not only that the, the crest, of course, is significant, but that it is um, done using kind of Nahin or Chilkat weaving style design, you know, form line design, using those colors of a Nahin weaving black and white and blue and a little bit of yellow, uh, which to me is a way of um, acknowledging the fact that it was a Ganak Tedi, pardon my, my pronunciation, but the Ganak Tedi clan that married um, a woman, one of the chiefs married a woman from, uh, I believe it was the Nass River, uh, who brought this weaving with her. She brought a waist robe uh, where the women of the clan kind of reverse engineered it and learned how to weave it. And then from that time on, uh, uh, this style of weaving, the heen weaving, is really associated with the Chilkat Valley. And so I think there is this, this really um, subtle but powerful version of that connection in, in this collar. Uh, I also want to show you uh, one of the two leggings, again, worn by the same man. You see them wrapped around his, his lower legs, um, that these uh, leggings are just amazing. I mean, the creativity and the beauty and the color and the drama of it. I mean, these are women who are experimental, who are creative, who are trying new things. Uh, but, and I, I, I've loved these leggings for a long time. And again, you know, it's, it's clear this is the emerging frog, um, it's kind of downward facing frog, but I could never quite figure out what, what was going on here in the center until I looked at some of the house posts in, in Klukwan. Um, the frog house, for example, some of the interior house posts have these downward facing frogs. And then between the rear legs, you see uh, another crest figure. So I thought, well, that could be, you know, that could have been an inspiration or the other inspiration I think was um, in the, the whale house where one of the uh, major house posts flanking the rain screen um, shows the, the, tells the story of the, the girl and the woodworm where you have a figure of, of the young girl holding the woodworm that she has raised from a, a tiny, it, it being very tiny. And right beneath that, you see a crane uh, wrapping kind of its wings around a downward facing frog. So 
to me, it seems the beater looked perhaps at that particular house post and thought, how can I turn that into two dimensions? And then it would become again, three dimensions when wrapped around the legs of, um, of, the, of the wearer. So this really kind of innovative translation of uh, these, these crests uh, in, in new materials, new me media, but telling the same very significant, very important stories that have been handed down for, for generations. So I'm gonna move on to the middle part of the 20th century. Uh, and this chapter is really inspired by Larry McNeil. Uh, Larry McNeil is a very well-known photographer. Um, he's had exhibitions in the National Museum of the American Indian and at the Alaska State Museum. Um, he does really amazing work and he really uh, points to his mother and his grandmother and his matrilineal line for um, his hard his work ethic, his uh, uh, creative abilities and um, the strength that he has gotten from them. Uh, he has written uh, that, you know, women are um, the reason why Clinkett people are considered warriors. They get their strength from their mothers, from their grandmothers. And so this is an image um, that is in honor of his mother. You can see here, uh, Anita McNeil is a girl and her mother, uh, Mary Brown Betts. This was taken, I believe in 1943. This is a family snapshot. Uh, we know it's during World War II because you can see this little flag hanging in the window, which indicates to passers-by that uh, two members of the family are um, in the war, they are fighting the war on, on one of the, the fronts. Um, and here at the center, of course, you have uh, this mother-daughter duo, uh, the mother, um, Mary Brown Betts, who is uh, working and sewing on moccasins and her daughter who is holding and displaying, um, displaying a finished pair. Um, and this is really important because Mary Brown Betts um, uh, works incredibly hard so that her daughter, Anita could go to school and not have to drop out to, to help raise uh, the family. This is a large family, lots of children. And this was a way of keeping her in school, which uh, was really important because she was going to the, the school, um, you know, kind of the, the better of the schools in Juneau, um, where she was the valedictorian. And this is something that's remembered in the community as, as how she was the valedictorian of the school. She was the smartest girl in the school. Um, and so a really important story. Um, this is, you know, a couple years before the Anti-Discrimination Act was passed in Alaska um, and a really important moment. Uh, so this work to me, again, um, really kind of uh, foregrounds that warrior spirit, foregrounds the importance of that matrilineal line um, and, and just foregrounds kind of the complexity of this era. Um, I balanced this with research uh, in the archives in Anchorage, or sorry, in Anchorage in Juneau uh, the Alaska Native Arts and Crafts Cooperative. Um, there's this huge, rich archive there. And when I first went into it, I didn't really know what I was going to find. But what I did find was the fact that there were over 500 women from the late 1930s to the early 1970s who were beading and sewing to sell through ANAC. Um, this huge number of women. And of course, I we grew up in Alaska. And when I thought of, of Anak, I thought think of things like baling baskets from the north and dolls from the west and maybe model totem poles from southeast. But in fact, the biggest selling kind of uh, uh, biggest selling uh, or the, 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 the it was moccasins that, that were making the most money, I should say, for, for Anak, that there were so many women making them. Uh, and one of the really great anecdotes that um, I sent this information to Larry and he looked at it and he said, oh, I see my mom, you know, she made all of these moccasins, but there was a couple month gap there after I was born. So again, you know, working mothers that there are, they were doing this work, they were feeding their families, especially when the men were away at war. Um, this was really important, not only economically, but culturally as well, because this knowledge was being passed from one generation to the next, really important history that is not getting much attention. It's, it's starting to, you know, if you, think, if you think about the literature of the Northwest Coast, you know, the 20th century, the early part of the 20th century is always seen as a period of, of little or no art making. But in fact, there was an incredible amount of art making that was happening and people are starting to pay attention to that history now. It's a really important era. So then I'm gonna move into, uh, into the contemporary period uh, here. And this is a work by Tannis Silton. Uh, she is an amazing artist. Uh, and this piece just, you know, when I first came across it, I was so inspired. Um, and I've had some great conversations with Tannis about it. But this is a coat, it doesn't have a name, but it is really 
again, bringing together all of these really rich, important ideas about uh, Tlingit ways of knowing, about the relationship to the land. Um, it's really referencing the you know, 10,000 plus years that Tlingit people have been in Southeast Alaska. Um, and it's referenced in a very subtle way. Uh, you can kind of see here on the arms, uh, you have these little freshwater pearls. Um, you have these grommets, which represent the suckers of, of octopus. Um, so again, you know, thinking about those connections, that land, it's, they also reference octopus bags, you know, just thinking about that knowledge that came across from the interior, octopus bags came from interior people, and then Clinket women on the coast transformed it uh, into something that made sense for them here, or, or sorry, in, in Southeast, I'm, I'm in Vancouver, we don't have octopus bags. Um, but again, a really important kind of connection to that, that history. Um, and also just to show you the back here, this is the nape of the neck. And on the nape of the neck, you see this amazing um, uh, uh, design. And this is a design of an octopus that is, was created by her great grandmother, Mary Berries, um, and a design that was handed down uh, from Mary Berries to her daughter, then to her daughter, Maria Ackerman Miller, who is uh, probably well known to some people in the audience. Um, and then finally to Tannis in this tin. And I have to say, uh, when I when Tannis shared this tin of designs with me, I was just floored because so many different people have said, oh, I have this tin of moccasin top designs and I had never seen one before. And she brought it out and I got to see it. And it was, it was a really powerful uh, moment for me to really, again, see that matrilineal line, see that knowledge that's being passed, the intangible knowledge being passed, but also the tangible knowledge, the, the way of making and creating um, to show uh, important uh, clan histories, to, uh, to make a living, you know, there's such a rich um, meaning for all of these things. Uh, she, Tannis also acknowledges her mother. You see this little strip of teal on the sleeve uh, or hanging from the sleeve of the coat. Uh, that is in reference to um, uh, Maria Miller's uh, Chilkat weaving signature. And she used this turquoise blue. So this is a, a subtle way of referencing that, that history. Uh, I will also just point out um, the collar that's being uh, displayed on this mannequin. Uh, this is called Some People of the Tide, uh, Raven, Coho, and Octopus. Um, again, it's a, uh, it's a collar, um, and I have written elsewhere about these collars, uh, dance collars being kind of metaphors for Clinkett armor um, from the 18th century. In the 19th century, they became, you know, a place to put your crest, um, and in the 21st century, um, they've become these really amazing, at least in, in Tannis' way, become these kind of abstracted uh, works of art. Um, here, this, the kind of wedge shape of it is meant to emulate a raven's tail. Um, the kind of swirl of bugle beads here uh, represent a Coho clan crest. Um, these bugle beads were given to her by her mother, so her mother is part of this as well. Um, in the back, you can't see it in this image, but there are the kind of the closing part of the, uh, of the collar looks like the, the tail of a Coho salmon. And then again, grommets on here as well reference the octopus and the octopus bag and that, you know, those relationships, those trade relationships often centri centered on women uh, to the interior. It's a really uh, rich and powerful piece. She's also referencing um, armor uh, in the material and the construction of this particular coat. It is made of this really heavy duty industrial felt. Um, you know, it has this very strong um, shape. And again, it's to reference that warrior history um, that uh, Clinton people have. Um, and that is, again, a subtle nod, nod to that history as well. So, uh, I talk about Tannis's work. I also talk about the work of Chloe French, Shken George, and Lily Hope in this chapter, uh, really looking at how they've taken the 19th century forms of the octopus bag and the dance collar and reinvented them for the 21st century and just in really diverse and amazing ways. So really uh, love uh, that, that, that history, the way in which uh, the creativity that's being shown uh, through their work. It's quite amazing. So the final kind of closing chapter is the epilogue. Um, and here I'm uh, looking at connections, indigenous connections uh, up and down the coast um, and connections that haven't been explored a lot because of this imposed border between the US and Canada, which you know has really defined the way scholarship is done in a lot of ways uh, over the past hundred years or so. Um, so the reason I kind of got into this area and thinking about those borders and thinking about women's roles in crossing those borders was this hat. 
Um, this hat is in the collection of the Canadian Museum of History in Ottawa. Uh, and I saw it and I read the description. I was like, this is really unusual. Uh, and I was trying to, you know, just kind of thinking about it. And, and it's been on the back of my mind for quite a long time. And as I've done research, I've, I've learned quite a bit more. And it's really a great history here. The description is beaded hat worn by the chief of the Tungus tribe. The center is a crest species of duck. And the two at the side are the hook nosed salmon. The back with the horned head represents the mountain demon in Indian language, Fort Rupert. And it's like, there's so many things going on in this. But what stood out to me was Tungus tribe, uh, Fort Rupert, and, uh, and, and that was like, well, there is a very specific connection between the Tungus tribe and Fort Rupert, and that is Anaslaga, or Mary Ebbets Hunt. Um, Mary Ebbets Hunt was a high-ranked young woman from the Tantaquan, um, and she married an HBC Hudson Bay Company factor by the name of Robert Hunt in the middle part of the 19th century, and they settled in Fort Rupert where she had her children, raised her family. Uh, one of her uh, most well-known uh, children was George Hunt, who worked with Franz Boas, the anthropologist, um, uh, about on Kwakwakwak. Uh, history and language. Um, and so that's, you know, people have often heard of, of George Hunt and less outside of Alaska or outside of kind of Kwakwakwak territory, less people have heard about Onislaga. So again, uh, you know, this is a Sisi youth, which is a supernatural snake. It's a very important figure within Kwakwakwak cultural practices. Um, so to have this kind of beating in kind of this Northern style, with this connection, I was I figured this must have come come through with Anaslaga. Now Anaslaga uh, in uh, in Kwakwakwak territory um, is really known for uh, her weaving. And here I'm showing you a 19th century photograph taken in Fort Rupert. It's likely of the Hunt family, um, but this figure here you can see is wearing a, a Nahin robe, a Chilkat robe. Uh, woven by Anaslaga, uh, what's harder to see is that he's also wearing one of these beaded caps. Um, this cap in particular is still in the Hunt family. It's been passed down through the generations. There's a whole set of these hats that are in museum collections um, in different parts of North America and also in Europe. Um, and I've had you know, the, the great pleasure of talking with some uh, of Anaslaga's descendants who shared some uh, information about these hats with me. And you know, it's, it's just this really neat, connection. Um, and it's so working out kind of did, which ones did Anaslaga bead? Or did she beat them? Did her daughters beat them? There's also stories of her having an Athapaskan slave, uh, an enslaved woman who came with her who may have been the beater. So there's definitely several uh, stories that are connected to these hats that are still, you know, still untangling them. Uh, but it's a, a really, again, this rich history of a woman um, who brought this whole new, uh, new ways of creating tangible cultural belongings with the weaving and the beading to a different part of the coast where uh, in Kwakwakwak territory, it really flourished as well. So, you know, really important uh, history, history there. And this history is, is being, as I said, is starting to become um, understood more broadly as artists and scholars are, are looking into it. And just to, to finish off, I want to bring in the work of uh, Marianne Nicholson. She's a Kwakwakiwak artist from Gwaii or Kingdom Inlet. She's done this series of paintings of tunics. Um, and, and in conversations with her, she you know, acknowledges that these tunics uh, came to Kwakwakiwak territory with, uh, uh, from, from Clinket territory uh, and then became really well used within, um, with, as regalia in Kwakwakiwak communities. Um, today, these are still being used, these tunics, but only young men get to wear them. And her, part of her um, work is to kind of re bring those histories of women out again, because she feels that women probably also wore these in the end of the 19th century, but, you know, kind of the paternal, paternalistic, uh, patriarchal structures of settler colonialism, again, has kind of hidden those histories of women. Uh, so she is an amazing artist but, and scholar, um, and it does this really incredible work. Uh, these, this particular pair of paintings um, is uh, of, in memory of her grandmother, uh, a very powerful woman, um, and she's making all sorts of references. Here you see uh, this, uh, this is the front, and this is the back. You see this sea youth, that uh, supernatural serpent is kind of hanging on the shoulders of this, of this tunic to indicate the weight of this history and the importance of it. 
Uh, she represents dentalia, which is kind of the precursor to beads on the coast, a very highly valued trade item used in regalia, also used uh, and very sp specifically connected to puberty rituals for young girls. Um, she also is referencing the you know, thousands of years of connection to the land um, through the, the fauna and the flora that she's included here. Uh, she is rep representing wealth uh, through the shapes of the coppers um, that are here and in uh, you know, Kwakwakiwak territory, a broken copper is even more valuable and, and shows more prestige. Uh, the eyes of each of the coppers are quarters uh, to indicate the children that her grandmother gave birth to. Uh, in Kwakwakiwak uh, cultural practices, uh, you give out quarters uh, uh, to recognize the birth of a child. So she's put embedded quarters onto this canvas to show you know, all of the 16 children, I believe, uh, that she had. So again, layers and layers of meaning. Um, and, Ma and Marianne Nicholson actually has come up to Alaska and shared kind of a lot of uh, knowledge with, um, with artists in Alaska about working with the market, um, how, to, you know, how to balance your practice as a, a artist who is making work for the market, but also making work for your community. And, and so you know, kind of in a way, you can almost see it as an exchange back up the coast of knowledge in the way that Anaslaga brought it down the coast in the 19th century. So, you know, this ongoing connection between the past and the present, it's always connected, it's always looking forward, it's always looking back. And it's, I think, um, one of the things about, about these beading practices that's so exciting is that, um, you know, it's, it's this, how central women have been to this knowledge, to maintaining the knowledge, to passing the knowledge on to the next generation. Um, through a very, very difficult uh, discriminatory uh, period. Uh, so that kind of is the, the very broad overview of the book. There's lots more stories, lots more images. I'm just showing you a few of my favorites. Um, I want to end by saying to many of the people who share their time and memories with me. Uh, sadly, many have, have walked into the forest, um, but I'm so grateful that they were able to uh, talk with me and 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 support the the work that I've done here. Um, and one final image, of course, this is a beautiful work that graces the back cover of my book uh, by Chloe French. Um, and it is an image of the petroglyphs near Sitka. Um, again, it's this connection looking to the past uh, for the future, doing something you know really innovative and creative that's future forward looking um, as a means to acknowledge. The, the ongoing sovereignty of Tlingit people in Southeast Alaska and that connection to the land and the power and importance of it. And, you know, I hope my book uh, contributes to that understanding and shows how significant beating has been in, in that ongoing uh, connection. So thank you. Happy to answer questions. Sure. One of the things that we're curious about, and you have mentioned this has been your field of study, you've done quite a bit of research about this topic over the years. How has that changed, written or approached the subject? That's a, a great question. And I, I think I, I mentioned a little earlier, though, that, that the focus has shifted, right? So when I was going to school and doing my dissertation, it was, you know, really at that moment when people were thinking about um, museum collections and what kinds of things were collected, what kinds of things are displayed, why that's problematic for indigenous people. And so it was the beginning of the, those conversations which have really changed. And so that's kind of where I was enmeshed in is also creating this, this database of images. Like you couldn't find beading anywhere because it wasn't put on display, it wasn't written about. And so I went to all these museums and photographed things and I was able to kind of make um, a big collection of around a thousand pieces of beadwork um, to start thinking through the ideas of beading. Um, so, you know, fast forward quite a number of years, uh, I realized that what I am really interested in is not so much the museums, but it's the women. Um, I was really interested in, in you know, focusing on, on those connections, on how this knowledge has um, been kept, how it's been changed, um, and especially with something like beading, which has just flown under the radar of everything, but everybody in Southeast Alaska has stories of their grandmothers, their aunties, their mothers beading or teaching them to bead or 
you know, so many stories of people who uh, helped pack the boxes that would be sent to Juno and sold through Anac, or making the necklaces that would go on, you know, the, the pendants or, you know, finishing up the moccasins. I mean, this has been, uh, you know, for uh, generations, part of everybody's kind of daily life, right? But, um, you know, more within the scholarly world, this was not seen as something important. So I really wanted to shift my focus to the women and the beating, much less than the kind of, um, institutional structures that that kind of explain that. Why has women's work, especially beading, not been centered within the broader discourse about Northwest Coast art? Yeah, uh, again, it comes really out of um, settler colonialism. You know, I mean, all of these things are tied together uh, with museums, uh, museum collecting, with missionization, uh, it, all of those things have always, you know, privileged the male perspective, privileged men as being, um, you know, first class citizens and women, second class, and of course, indigenous women, even lower than that, right? So um, that's, that's where this kind of uh, disconnect has happened. Uh, and some of those ideas have been absorbed into communities and, and so on. And that's, that's the reality of all indigenous people across uh uh, across the world, right? And so um, what's really amazing though is, is right now we're in this moment where so many um, uh, indigenous scholars and artists and, and elders and others are starting to recenter that conversation, trying to kind of cast off that, um, you know, the, the, the settler colonialism concepts uh, to really, again, ground cultural practices in this idea of balance, um, this idea of, of um, you know, how women, uh, you know, are, are the ones who produce the next generations, right? And so I think um, that that is, you know, it's, it's two different, very different worldviews. And I think that what, you know, in my book, I'm trying to acknowledge this other worldview um, and trying to show how it was distorted by, by the institutions of settler colonialism. And, you know, I've been working on this project for a very long time, but what's really exciting is that there are a lot of people who are working on this, there's this amazing exhibition that came out, um, Native American Women Artists, which uh, I was really fortunate to co-write an essay with um, Catherine Bunn Marcuse at University of Washington on women's art on the Northwest Coast. But we were just one small section of that, of that conversation. They had uh, artists and elders and scholars from all across North America who were looking at museum collections and seeing that you know, of the indigenous artworks in these museum collections, maybe 90% were made by women, 90%, can you believe this? But what we, the, the stories and the histories that are shown are not, the, are not those stories and histories. Um, and so this was a huge corrective to um, the understanding of museum collections themselves, right? So, um, you know, it's a really exciting time to be working in this field and to, you know, uh, to be able to, um, you know, connect with these, these amazing artists and scholars and, and to kind of share this um, vision of, of rectifying, you know, a lot of history that hasn't told the whole story. Research, especially when it's being conducted by those outside of an Indigenous community, writing about an Indigenous community's arts and culture is often very extractive. What were your ethical concerns and how did your research approach these issues? Yeah, that's a great, another great question. And it's one that I struggle with always, you know, am I doing enough? Am I doing enough? I don't know. Um, but one of the things that I've, I've really tried to do is, you know, I, most of this work is focused on work that is in museums or is, has been made for the market and, and, and sold out of communities because I feel like, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, this is not plan. Uh, ooh, I feel like that's not my place to write about that. You know, much of this is, is that. And so, uh, you know, part of that was focusing on what's in the museum collections and what can I, you know, talk about there. Um, another thing I do is that with um, the work that I've written about, um, I always send what I've written to the person I'm writing about, right? So uh, they have final say on what, uh, on what I um, have written. So, um, you know, I've had back and forth with many of the artists uh, that are included in this book and, and you know, they, they've given me uh, feedback, which I've incorporated then. So trying to, you know, it's, it's been, it's building trust, it's building a relationship and it's just being open and honest with, um, with where I'm coming from 
and also uh, making sure that uh, the artists uh, I work with are, are happy with the way I've represented their work. Uh, so those are all things that I keep in mind. How does your work directly give back to those communities that you're writing about? Absolutely, yes. Um, uh, it is a really important consideration when doing this kind of work, especially as a non-Indigenous person, um, a, a settler, uh, and that I've tried really hard to keep this kind of at the foreground of my research and, and always thinking of ways to, to give back uh, as best I can. And one of the things uh, that's really key to a lot of this book is the relationships that I've developed with the artists whose work I've included in the book. Um, and that's just, you know, through uh, conversations, uh, through sending them uh, drafts of the writing I've done about their work in order to get their feedback and for them to pick up on any mistakes I may have made. Uh, and this is a really important part of that. So I have the approval of all the artists I work with on, on what I've written. Um, I've gotten you know, permission from the artists to include their works in the book and they've all been so gracious about it. I'm really, really fortunate. Um, other things I have done in the past uh, more broadly are to present aspects of this work as it's been in process at, at clan conferences in Southeast Alaska, which has been a great way to uh, uh, get some feedback and I've had people come up to me and we, we talk about their own experiences of, of beating in their families and that's been wonderful as well. And the other big thing, which I will be doing once you know the book starts to sell, and I, I'll get some royalties, although you know academic books don't don't make a lot of money. Uh, but whatever royalties I do get, I am planning on donating to arts organizations in Southeast Alaska. So literally giving something back uh, to help develop the next generation of artists. Can people find information and pictures about the Clinket beadwork held in museum collections that you have compiled throughout your research? Absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so it's not easy to access. Uh, unfortunately, one way you can access is that my dissertation is actually online. And so you can go to the University of British Columbia Library and you can download all 696 pages of it. It's very large, but three about 350 pages of that are terrible black and white photographs of the about thousand pieces of beadwork that I uh, photographed. Um, for uh, in museum collections across North America. Uh, so you can either you know, download that, look at those images, and then beautifully what's happened since I wrote that dissertation is that so many museums now have uh, their, their collections online. So you can go and you can uh, actually see if the museum where a piece that looks familiar to you is, go online and see if you can access it through um, through that, that museum database. Uh, and so you can get more of the information about who collected it and that sort of thing. Um, there's also, uh, Sea Alaska Heritage has a copy of my dissertation as well that's printed out. I think the Alaska State Library uh, has it on CD. Uh, so, you know, you can get that. And the one that's printed out for Sea Alaska Heritage, I believe is in color. So at least you have color pictures and, and the one that's on the CD at the Alaska uh, State Library um, is also color images. So if you don't, you know, have good computer uh, connections or whatever, and you happen to be in Juneau, those would be a couple of places where you can find that stuff. You can also get in touch with me. I'm always happy to, you know, send pictures out or tell you, you know, more information as well. So, um, you know, that is that is something I'm always open to uh, having conversations about. That I'm um, there is a Facebook group I'm part of. It's Alaska uh, Native Beadwork Collectors, and people post really great pictures, not just from Southeast, but from all over Alaska. Um, and so, you know, I, I've had some dialogues there as well. And, and so I'm, I'm always open to learning more and loving to put the names of the women who created these works to actual pieces. And that is something that, you know, is a whole other area that, that could be done. Um, and it's just one that I, I couldn't do uh, given the scope of the book already, so. Are there more areas to explore and share about Clinket beadwork? You know, I, I feel like a lot of, I feel like this is kind of the first foray into this and that there's so much that really should be done from the community, right? That, um, and I, I would really encourage encourage that, especially um, the, the regalia that's still with, within the clans. And uh, one of my most exciting moments was um, being at the opening of the Walter Sobolev building in Juneau, I think it was 2015. And uh, one of the clans um, from Klukwan brought, brought out a piece of regalia, a tunic. And then I was like, oh my gosh, 
I've been wondering where that tunic has been because I'd seen it in multiple photographs from the 19th century and the clans is still using it. It's still a very important piece of au. And I was so thrilled, you know, because there is all of that knowledge that is there. Um, and again, me being a non-Indigenous uh, person and being a non-Klinkit person, you know, I don't want to impose myself on, on those histories, which I think are, are, are not mine to tell. What projects are you interested in writing about next? Um, I, you know, I, I of course, uh, I've written about Shkan George uh, a few times and, you know, uh, she and I go way back. Um, and I, I'm always, I always like, she puts something new out in the world. And I'm like, oh, I really feel like I need to write about that. So, you know, she's got this, I would love to write more about Shkan. Lily Hope is doing such amazing work. Um, you know, part of me is thinking that, that now I've got this beadwork book out of my system that, that possibly, um, you know, I would be really love to write about what's happening with the revitalization of weaving right now. There are so many incredible weavers who are doing just amazing work. And so that would be maybe a, um, something that I'm thinking about. But another thing I'm thinking about is um, co-writing a book on uh, women's work more broadly along the, the West Coast, the Pacific Northwest Coast. Um, I think this is, again, um, as part of that process of bringing these histories out and, and um, centering them again. Uh, these are just some big, broad ideas that I'm interested in. In the course of writing Painful Beauty, were there any other things that just shocked and delighted you or favorite anecdotes that you'd like to share? I guess, I think the thing that really, one of the things, well, I told you my favorite story, which is the moccasin story. That is to me, the most amazing thing is when, you know, these epiphanies happen, these, these unexpected uh, things you find in the archive that just open up, you know, whole new ways of thinking about, uh, about that history. That, that to me is my favorite part of, of doing research. Um, I think for me, one of the, I find writing difficult and hard. And it's part of the reason why it's taken me so long <laughs> to turn my dissertation into a book is because I wanted to get it as right as I possibly could. Any mistakes that are in it are, are definitely my own. So I just want to make sure that that's out there. Um, but uh, I think one of the easiest chapters for me to write was actually the chapter, my contemporary chapter, because, um, you know, in talking to the artists who are doing this work, it was, it was just, it just kind of rolled out of me. And I think it's because I've been thinking about these ideas for so long and the work that, you know, Tannis, that Chloe, that Shkan and Lily are doing um, are, are just so, um, they're so powerful. They are making really strong statements about women um, they're making really strong statements about creativity. Um, they are, you know, basing their ideas on these historical forms, but taking them in wholly new directions. And for me, um, that was incredibly inspirational. And so I, I was able to just kind of write the draft of that chapter in a couple of days, which is completely unheard of. I usually agonize for you know, years <laughs> on these things. So that was surprising for me, but it was because I was being inspired by incredible artists. Your book is now published. What has the initial reception been like so far? People are really excited about it because it is kind of this untold history. It's a very well-known history in the community, um, but more widely, it's, it's a history that hasn't really been put out there in the world. So I think people are excited about that. Um, yeah, so, so far I've gotten, you know, based on what I've gotten from the artists who've read their sections of the book, they're really excited. Um, that I know that the press is really excited. I'm really excited. You know, it's, I think, I'm hoping that it's going to fill a, a gap in the literature. I'm hoping that it's going to inspire people um, in terms of scholarship, but also in terms of creating artwork. Uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing the first reviews when they, they start coming out. We're excited too. Thank you for joining us for Museum Midday and sharing about your book, Painful Beauty, Clinket Women, Beadwork, and the Art of Resilience. Oh, it was my pleasure. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's the first time I've been able to talk about my book as a book. So I thank you for that. And thanks to everyone who joined us for this Museum Midday. We look forward to sharing our entire season with you and hope that you will join us again next month on October the 7th at noon.